But not only is that ineffective, it's also boring when you're just on the elliptical machine doing this. But in reality, the exercise component of weight loss is actually very minor and not terribly effective. Exercise has many benefits, but weight loss isn't one of them. Experts refer to that as the compensation theory. And that is a very common problem when people start workout programs and they can't figure out why they're not losing weight anymore after that initial burst of excitement and motivation. In this video, I'm going to show you how much exercise you actually need to do to lose weight. You might be surprised by the number I'm about to give you. And make sure to stick around until the end because I'm going to show you a strategy to get the most out of your workouts in the least amount of time possible. There is a way. These are the exact same tips that I give to all my coaching clients and they've all gone to see some amazing results. So you know it works. And if you're interested in joining my coaching program, then make sure to check out the link somewhere at the top here or in the description below. Before we get started, don't forget to give this video a like, subscribe to my channel and hit the bell to get notified every time I post a new video every week. Now, who am I to tell you how much exercise you need to do to lose weight? Because some of the haters out there will say that, well, I'm not a big guy. And although I can't do anything about my stature, I was a national level weightlifter for years. I trained with some of the best weightlifters in Canada. I placed second worldwide in my weight class in an online weightlifting competition. I own all the provincial records in my weight class up to this day. In short, I used to be a competitive exerciser in a sport where I had to make weight. Now, a lot of people are told or are under the impression that they have to do a lot in terms of energy expenditure in order to lose weight. And this goes back to the infamous calories in versus calories out weight loss model. So now we've got the masses sweating their hearts out on the treadmill or whatever their favorite cardio machine is. Or they do these overly strenuous group fitness classes. But not only is that ineffective, it's also boring when you're just on the elliptical machine doing this. The rate of sustainability is also very low especially when you do these super intense cardio-based group fitness classes. And they're really popular right now where it almost feels like a near-death experience every time you do it. I go to a Muay Thai gym and the cardio classes are always packed. The barrier of entry is also very high, especially with this public health problem going around. You have to reserve your spot ahead of time. Then you have to find the time to go to the gym. You gotta get dressed, get in the car, drive through traffic, get changed, drive back home, and a whole list of other things. So that hour-long workout looks more like an hour and a half or even two hours when you add up all the things I just mentioned. No wonder making it to the gym can be such a drag for a lot of people. But in reality, the exercise component of weight loss is actually very minor and not terribly effective. Exercise has many benefits. It's unbelievably good for you, but weight loss isn't one of them. What I'm trying to say is more exercise does not equal more weight loss. A recent mind-blowing study done by Herman Ponser on the Hadza people in Tanzania proves that concept. They're still living a mostly hunter-gatherer way of life. Hadza men and women regularly walk four to seven miles every day, hunting wild game, harvesting honey, digging for tubers, picking berries, or gathering water and food. Put simply, they get more activity in a day than the average American or European gets in a week. We live a very sedentary lifestyle here in the West where I am. Here's what's surprising. The researchers found that the Hadza don't burn more calories than the average adult in the US and other industrialized countries. Hadza men burn about 2,500 calories a day. For Hadza women, it's 1,900 calories. That's par for the course. One would think that they would be burning like at least double that. Nope. Like I said, exercise has many benefits. It's just not gonna help you drop the 20 pounds of excess body fat that you're trying to get rid of. What's making us fat, the data suggests, is eating too much of the wrong food rather than moving too little. Basically, it's more gluttony than sloth. A lot of fitness influencers out there convince the masses to go to the gym to do the battle ropes, do a spin class, then go do a hip class afterwards, or whatever is hip out there. Listen, nobody's gonna do that consistently. That's just the reality of it. I've coached thousands of people by proxy when I used to teach classes at my local gym. You can really only expect the average person to go to the gym twice a week. Personally, I'm a gym rat. That's definitely my thing, as well as a very small group of people out there. But that's more of the exception, not the rule. I can't assume that everybody wants to go to the gym and sweat, get tired, breathe heavy, and all that stuff. Most people don't. And I'm here to tell you today that you don't have to. Instead, you can start by picking off the lowest hanging fruit of exercise by going for a 10-minute walk. Ideally, do that at least three times a day, morning, lunch, and dinner. 
before you drop $1,500 on a Peloton or a fitness mirror, see if you can go for a 10 minute walk every day for a week first. Then you can buy the expensive machine if you want to. But if you can't commit to a daily walking routine, you probably shouldn't buy the machine. It's most likely just gonna collect dust. If you wanna maximize your results from walking, go for a 10 minute walk after a meal. Within 15 minutes of finishing a meal to let your body digest a little, go for a walk. If you eat three square meals a day, there's your daily walking requirement if you do it after a meal. Now, why am I such a big fan of walking? Well, number one, it's sustainable. Almost anybody can do it. You can do it anywhere. You don't need any special equipment to do it. If the weather is terrible, you can just bundle up. I'm in Canada right now, it's winter. We had a cold spell for a week where the temperature dropped in the minus 30 Celsius or minus 22 Fahrenheit plus the wind chill which makes it feel even colder. You can bet that I was still out there walking like a nerd. There's actually treadmills in my building that I could have used, but there's so many benefits of doing your walks outdoors like exposing your eyes to the sun to align with your natural circadian rhythm. You also get the stress lowering benefits of forest bathing or nature bathing. There's a park next to my building and I do my walks there regularly. There's also a lot of dogs there and I love dogs. Walking in the cold also acts like a free cryotherapy session, which also brings a boatload of benefits. The cold is actually your friend. That's why I do my walks outdoors, regardless of the weather. If the sun is out in the summer, I walk around shirtless to get some much needed vitamin D. But if you're not a crazy person like me walking around in frigid temperatures, I get it. At worst, you can just walk around your house. Again, walking has so many unbelievable benefits. Blood sugar control is one of the major ones for the context of this video. We live in a society where 88% of American adults have some form of metabolic dysfunction. A lot of skinny fat people belong in that 88 percentile. Experts like Dr. Phil Maffetone refers to them as over fat people, which means that only one out of every 10 would be considered metabolically healthy. We are in an over fat epidemic. One in two American adults have prediabetes. Most of them don't even know they have it. I mean, ask yourself, when was the last time you got blood work done? You can't just hope and pray that you don't die if you're a responsible adult. 70% of American adults are also either overweight or obese. Experts are predicting that number to go up to 90% by 2030. The obesity rate is also at a staggering 42%. That rate is expected to go to 50% by 2030. Childhood obesity is also at an all-time high. I spent a year living in Mexico and their rates of obesity is also skyrocketing. They love drinking coke there for some reason. I mean, I guess everyone does. But their obesity rate right now is sitting at 28.9%. In Canada, where I am right now, it's actually higher at 29.4%. And that data was from 2016. It's almost guaranteed to be higher at this point, especially with this public health problem we've had over the last couple of years. But it's not all doom and gloom because walking is twice as effective as metformin for preventing or even reversing type 2 diabetes as studied. I repeat, twice as effective, which is just mind-blowing, without the potential side effects of taking a prescription drug. And it's free. It decreases the peak and duration of glucose elevation. Right behind, of course, the area under the curve for insulin. So that's a very healthy option for managing blood sugar. Everyone should be ecstatic about that information. You should tell your parents and all your elderly family members about this. That effectiveness of managing blood sugar and insulin has also been widely proven by people wearing continuous blood glucose monitors or CGM. They have a lower peak and lower duration. It actually cuts it by half if you go for a 15 minute walk after a meal. And I don't recommend walking for weight loss per se, although the calories you do end up burning is mostly coming from fatty acids because walking almost guarantees to keep you below your maximum aerobic heart rate. It's the infamous fat burning zone. That's a number popularized by legendary endurance coach, Dr. Phil Maffetone. He's really popular for a lot of things. It's 180 minus your age in beats per minute in case you're wondering. I also tell all my coaching clients not to do cardio for calories because however many calories it says on your fitness tracker or cardio machine is largely inaccurate anyway. Don't even look at it. Walking is also unbelievably great for digestion because of the mechanism of the stomach and muscles moving. It just helps move things around. A lot of cultures have been practicing walking after a meal for centuries, like the Italians. Walking is also great for general health. It elevates your heart rate and lowers blood pressure. It's great for stress release because it also elevates your mood. More importantly, it also stimulates a myokine called BDNF, which is short for brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is often touted as miracle growth for the brain. 
Some experts even argue that you actually want to exercise for the brain. But again, the biggest thing about walking is sustainability. Truth be told, I was a little late to the walking party. I really only started adapting it a few years ago. But now I do it religiously because of all the benefits I just mentioned. I do it when I'm in transit. And here's a quick funny story. When I was leaving Mexico and I was waiting for boarding, I'm one of those people that just walks around the airport. Well, for some reason, security thought that I was acting weird, I guess. And they decided to flag me and start asking me questions. Maybe it's the tattoos. I don't know. I intentionally take the stairs every time. I park further away because all the open spots are there anyway. I regularly go for walking dates. I live downtown and I always try to walk to places. When I eat out, I always try to walk home after my meal. Or I set my timer for 5 minutes, I walk around the street, that timer sounds, I walk back to my car, or I take an Uber home. Establishing a consistent walking habit gets you to 90% of your exercise requirement for health. It's that good for you. Now let's talk about what you should pair walking with, which is the 10% of your exercise equation. It's none other than resistance training. Why? Well, because it's pro-tissue, meaning it's the only form of exercise that builds and maintains muscle. And muscle, in case you didn't know, is the largest organ in the body. It's actually an endocrine organ. It secretes myokines that travels throughout the body that does a lot of good things. It's also the largest site for glucose disposal. It's the mechanism of health. In fact, it's your metabolic currency. That's why resistance training is far superior than cardio. It's not even close. There's really no comparison. In fact, resistance training is cardio. It also plays a key role when it comes to dieting because it allows you to hold on to your precious muscles. When you're just on a calorie deficit, the weight you end up losing is both fat and muscle. If you supplement it with resistance training, the weight you lose can just be mostly fat. That's how you end up getting that tight and toned look that basically everybody wants. I've never met anyone who didn't want nice looking arms and a nice looking booty. Heck, I like a nice looking booty for myself. What I've also learned over the years, and this is backed up by new research, is that it doesn't have to be heavy. You don't even need to go to the gym if you don't want to. That right there removes all the barrier for exercise. So as long as you get enough volume and it's intense, you're fine. So you can just do bodyweight movements like squats and push-ups at home. You can also get yourself some cheap bands. Depending on your budget, you can get a decent set for as little as 30 bucks. You can do your workout strategically right before your meals. That opens up your muscle suitcase. So if you consume carbs post-workout, most of it will just get transported to refill your liver and muscle glycogen stores. That's how you earn your carbs. The cool part about this is you really only have to do it twice a week. That's the minimum effective dose of resistance training. Now, I'm going to give you two reasons why I don't necessarily recommend doing more for people that want to lose weight. And it really just goes back to energy expenditure and how much work you have to do. For starters, again, doing more does not make it easy for people to comply with long term. You can only expect the average person to work out twice a week. That's just the reality of it. The second big reason is compensation. This has been proven time and time again. The harder you work, so you go to the gym, you do spin, crossfit, or hit, the more likely it is that you're gonna go home and eat more and just turn into a couch potato for the rest of the day. Experts refer to that as the compensation theory. And that is a very common problem when people start workout programs and they can't figure out why they're not losing weight anymore after that initial burst of excitement and motivation. And people do lose some weight at the beginning until the body eventually catches up to this unsustainable thing that they're doing. Because what tends to happen is they do a near-death experience workout at the gym and then they're completely exhausted afterwards. The unintended consequence is you tend to eat more food and just sit around more. And then it would take people a few days to recover from that really hard workout. Out. I used to be guilty of that. And the energy expenditure of that particular workout does not burn as many calories as the non-exercise activity thermogenesis or NEAT. Meaning just staying on your feet and just being active throughout the day. Like going for those relaxing 10 to 15 minute walks. A lot of fitness influencers and trainers fail to make that distinction. It's not just about going so hard at the gym that you're about to puke. Again, think about the studies done on the Hadza in Africa. They're not out there doing an hour-long spin class. In fact, they've probably never heard of spin. What I'm trying to say is 30 to 40 minutes of gym time does not burn as many calories as just being active throughout the day. An hour of hard cardio only burns around 400 calories. You immediately erase that if you eat a Krispy Kreme donut afterwards. I used to do some of my editing at a coffee shop right beside a spin studio. And the amount of people that I see get a latte with a scone after their spin class was very alarming. I mean, do the math. You expend calories just being around in life. 
If you just watch paint dry all day, your body will still expend calories just to keep you alive. So you're not really burning that much more when you're hating your life on the elliptical machine going like this for like 40 minutes. That's why I'd much rather prefer minimizing gym time to keep it sustainable and just have you live a more active lifestyle. Stay on your feet, move around. If you have a dog, take your dog out for a walk. You owe it to that dog. There's a disturbing study out there that if you sit for eight hours a day, which is what most people do, you have a 90% chance of developing diabetes. Nothing shuts down your fat burning metabolism faster than prolonged periods of stillness. For every hour that you're sitting, you should move around for five minutes. That's actually one of the biggest reasons why I switched to a stand-up desk. So live an active lifestyle. That should be your goal. That promotes optimal gene expression because we evolved to move as human beings. Go for a 10 to 15 minute walk three times a day. Do resistance training twice a week. 10 to 30 minutes is all you need. I mean, that's where I'm at these days. And being the exercise junkie that I am, I like to sprinkle in these one to two minute micro workouts a couple of times a day. I call them exercise snacks. In doing so, I maintain a physique that I'm pretty happy with and it doesn't take a lot of work. I really mostly do it for the cognitive benefits. It keeps my brain happy and sharp. More importantly, it's sustainable. It works for me. It also gives me a little bit more carb allowance. I'm not sweating it if I go past the 50 gram carb allowance that a lot of the keto bros out there live by. I'm also never doing cardio. Although yes, I do Muay Thai for play and socializing. It doesn't feel like work when I do it. In fact, I look forward to it. I also do the occasional sprint workout for the beneficial hormonal and metabolic adaptations, but that's beyond the scope of this video. In terms of specific movements for resistance training and how to be more efficient doing it, I'm a big fan of doing supersets because it allows you to do more work in less time. It keeps the workout short and intense. For example, doing a push-pull workout is a classic example of a superset. You can do a dip or a push-up, rest for a minute, then you can do some pull-ups and some banded rows and then rest for a minute, then do more dips, rest, pull-ups, rest, and just keep repeating that cycle. Then you can do some squats combined with some hamstring exercise like an RDL. The pull-ups hits your biceps and lats, and then the dips hits your triceps and a little bit of your chest. Two minutes in between each muscle groups is also enough time for ATP recovery so you can go hard again for the next set. In case you're wondering, adenosine triphosphate or ATP is the body's primary source for any muscle contraction or force exertion. If you go below that recommended two minute rest, then the workout kind of becomes more cardio based. And there's still benefits to that, don't get me wrong. But if you really wanna maximize muscle building, then you have to take a minimum two minute rest between major muscle groups. That's why doing supersets of push and pull with one minute breaks works really well because the time between each set of pushing movement is a little bit over two minutes. Again, that's enough time for ATP recovery, which maintains strength throughout the workout and you're not dropping off. If let's say you lower your rest to 30 seconds when you're doing supersets, you're not gonna be able to do as many reps or you're gonna have to take some weight off to get the same amount of reps. That is not optimal for hypertrophy, which is just a fancy word for an increase in growth of muscle cells. That's why I'm not a big fan of overdoing HIIT classes. I'm even gonna clump CrossFit in that category even though I love CrossFit workouts. It's just way too fatigue seeking, especially if you do too many Metcon workouts, which is what CrossFit is really popular for, where the goal is to just do as many reps in as little time as possible. That's usually when you see people's forms start to break down while they're doing these high level and high skill weightlifting movements. Unfortunately, that's what gets highlighted when you see some of these people bashing CrossFit, labeling it as dangerous. But again, going back to our more controlled supersets with adequate rest in between, you don't need a stupid amount of time to do those movements for the average person, unless you have bodybuilding aspirations, which again is beyond the scope of this video. But for the average person that just wants to look at shirtless, fit better in their clothes, maybe see some abs, and have that tight and toned look, that's all you need. Because those compound movements involve a lot of muscle groups. You can do them very quickly, especially if you do supersets. You can be done your workout in 10 to 30 minutes. You don't need to spend a lot of time warming up or do 30 minutes of prehab, especially if you're just doing bodyweight movements and bands. I mean, you can if you want to, obviously, but just get in there and do the work. You don't even need to put pants on if you're doing your workout at home. I mean, lions and cheetahs don't warm up. They just do cool feline things. In terms of volume, you can do around three to five sets for each body part per workout. So that's six to 10 sets in total for the week. If you do it twice a week, you'll obviously build more muscle if you go on the higher range just because of the volume. If you superset the movements and you're not on your phone in between sets, you can be done your workout in no time. 
in terms of reps, anywhere between a heavy five, a moderate 10 to a light 20 reps. Use that higher number if you're doing bodyweight movements. You're obviously going to get a little bit stronger lifting the heavy five and doing five sets, but they all result in significant hypertrophy for the average person. Assuming you work hard and you get within two to three reps of failure. And that's the intensity level part. You got to be honest with your effort. Like if you're doing bodyweight exercises, five reps is pretty easy. If you do 20, it's a lot more intense. So do resistance training twice a week, 10 to 30 minutes to trigger a muscle adaptation. That's it. And then those 10 to 15 minute walks every day, especially after a meal, that's all you need. Simple, right? The next question then becomes, how and what are you actually supposed to eat if you want to lose weight? Because 80% of your body composition is determined by your diet. This is also where a lot of people go wrong. Do you have a proven plan that you can follow? To help you with that, I want to give you a free copy of my Lean Body Blueprint. This is how I was finally able to get rid of all my stubborn fat without depriving myself of my favorite foods or spending countless hours doing cardio. It's a simple and proven four-step process specifically designed for busy professionals like you. And it's also the exact same blueprint that I teach to all my coaching clients and they've all gone to see some amazing results. If you want to be the next success story, then download your free copy of the Lean Body Blueprint right now. There's going to be a link somewhere at the top here or in the description box. Just click on it, type in your email, and I'll send it to you right away. Hey, give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and share it with your friends. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I post a new video every week. And feel free to comment below if you have any questions about this video. All right, I'll see you in the next one. Virtual high five.